Good afternoon and welcome to 365 Days of Amazing Stories with Theo Mayer. Uh, here we are on day 252. I'm sitting here in Kathmandu, Nepal. And um, so many days, almost two weeks into a Vastu architecture training. I'm not going to talk about that today. What I will talk about, though, is volunteering and what that can lead to in a person's life. Because today is Saturday, and I am going to be talking uh, about my own life, my life as a steward. Um, I've volunteered in so many different ways in my life, and I have had so many incredible things happen as a result of it, I'm watching some really cool birds go by. Um, I have to figure out what those are later. Anyway, how often do you volunteer to do something? Now, I'm not talking about volunteering necessarily to like, you know, help out at a soup kitchen or something like that. What I'm talking about more is volunteering, doing something that you want to learn how to do. You volunteer your time. It's kind of like uh, being an apprentice for a little while. Now, there was a time where I was living in Monterey, California. I had my dive business. And a lot of times when I'd be finished, I'd, you know, just feel like hanging out a little bit. And I, I like looking at the different boats. And down on one of the tiers, uh, this was when there was an old wooden pier that you weren't really allowed out on anymore. Eventually it got torn down and the cement wall got put up there. But um, right on that tier, I can't remember what it was, a dock maybe, there was a 67 foot wooden schooner that was getting rebuilt, refurbished. And the guy that was doing it, his name was Craig Harder. He was a Vietnam veteran, and he was had grown up as a fisherman. And he was outfitting the boat in order to make it out for the next season's albacore run. And this, this bird is very much like a magpie, only in Nepal. I have to check it out. Anyway, so Craig was trying to get ready for albacore season. And I probably, uh, you know, had been standing up there on the railing looking down at what was going on for weeks in the later part of the afternoon. And there'd usually be some other people there. But Craig, he noticed me after some time. And one day he, you know, said, hey, do you want to come down and see what I'm doing? And I said, sure. So he came up and let me in through the gate, which was locked. I went down there and he showed me everything that was going on. Um, he had two really serious boat carpenters working for him. They basically rebuilt uh, the inside of the boat, a lot of the uh, timbers, uh, the deck timbers and uprights, and they completely redecked the boat. Uh, so anyway, there was a lot of work going on. and. After talking to Greg, somehow, you know, I, I, I guess I probably offered, you know, to come and help some days. So when I had would have time, I'd go down there and help with whatever you needed help with. The first job that I did was to help grind the paint on the hull away. We ended up painting the hull of the boat while it was in the water. Um, you know, the bottom paint, which was red. Uh, was painted above the water line. Um, and you could also heel over the boat a little bit uh, by kind of winching one side over, which raised the other side up. So little by little, we made our way across the, the hull of the boat, and that way Craig didn't have to haul out in order to paint the boat. Um, while I'm down there, I get to know these two uh, boat carpenters, Danny Malone and, I, and Tom Mc curvy or something like that. Um, so anyway, I get to know them. 
we'll get back to those guys later. As it turned out from volunteering to help Craig out, and eventually I scrubbed the boat as well because it was getting close to the time that they were going to be, or, you know, going out fishing. Summer was coming up, and Craig at a certain point asked me if I wanted to go out and be part of the maiden voyage, basically, of the Hispaniola fishing for albacore. And I said yes. Why did it happen? Because I volunteered my time to help out on a project that I thought was pretty cool. I learned things in the process, and then I got invited to come out fishing, which was gonna be a paid endeavor. Um, and we went out. I had some amazing experiences fishing with Craig on the Hispaniola. We started out from Monterey, went way the hell offshore. There was a 671, uh, I don't know if it was a GMC or, I don't know. All I know is the diesel was called a 671. That was our main engine. And then we had a backup generator that we would run at night when we were drifting to keep the um, the refrigeration system going. Uh, so you'd catch albacore. The boat had these long uh, poles that you could bring up to vertical and then let out uh, on either side. And these things were some daggone long poles. And from each pole, we ran a bunch of hand lines. Um, I think there had to have been six hand lines off of each pole, and then there was a close hand line that just ran off the deck. And we had plastic lures on it and barbless, double barbless hooks. Um, and we, when we were into the fish, we were usually cruising along at about six knots or so. So our bait was moving. As the boat went from side to side, you know, the, the bait would move um, in such a way that you know, the tuna or the albacore would be really interested in, in hitting our lures. Um, and then once you were into fish, you always pulled the closest line first. So you'd pull that line up. Usually the fish weren't really big, maybe 35 pounds at the most, but typically smaller, kind of like 10 to 15. And you'd just swing the line up over. The fish would hit the deck. Typically when it hit the deck, the hook would pop out and you'd throw that line back in. And you'd keep working your way from the inside to the outside because the inside were the quickest ones to pull in. So that was an amazing thing. Uh, we were out there for, I don't know, a week or something and our generator, the bearing in the generator went bad, which meant that we couldn't run that thing um, at night, which was a big deal because you didn't want to run the big engine at night burned up too much fuel. So we ended up uh, cruising into Morrow Bay uh, to get whatever parts we needed to to fix it. And I remember I, I was on watch. That was one of the things, like somebody was always awake on the boat. And it was at a time where you had to be careful and on watch. Uh, you know, back in those days, it was the early 80s, Big ships were still running over small boats. Uh, they never even knew they'd hit them. And many fishermen died out in the Pacific in this way. So we always kept somebody up. Anyway, when we're running, moving, day or night, you always had two people up. One who was running the boat and the other person was on watch. On that particular run into Mara Bay, it was nighttime coming on into morning and there was like this mist on the water, which was incredible. But the most magnificent was that there was an incredible bloom of uh, bioluminescence going on. So as the boat made its way through the water, it left a trail of water that was illuminated as we passed through it. It was just absolutely stunning. And I, I would be going from the stern to the bow because, you know, as the boat is making its way through the water, the, um, the bioluminescence would start uh, and, you know, go down the sides. So I was out there on the bow and 
these dolphins, or it could have been porpoises, I can't remember. I think it's the white-sided dolphin, came in next to the boat and started riding the bow wave. <laughs> it was just incredible. I ended up laying down on the bow spread and reaching down toward them. And every time I could, I would uh, make some kind of sound or hoot in appreciation of the show that they were really putting on. And their bodies would be streaking, you know, the bioluminescence would be streaking off their bodies. As the boat went along, you know, fish, you could see where the fish were too, because the fish would get out of the way and leave a little trail of bioluminescence. This went on for a little while, and, and then the, the dolphin veered off, and you know, I thought they were gone. Then they come back in. This went on for, you know, probably 10 minutes, back and forth, and you know, all around the boat. And you know, every time they came up to breathe, you know, there'd be this little exhalation of air that you could hear. I never really thought I heard the in inhalation. Uh, most incredible thing, the memory I will just absolutely not forget. How did it come about? Because I volunteered my time to help out with a cool project that I ended up learning from. Danny and Tom were pretty damn incredible. Um, I ended up, uh, I, I've got to tell another story, probably next Saturday I'll tell it, but they ended up starting to build a house in Pacific Grove and I found out about it, and just like with Craig Harder, End of the day, when I was done work, I would drive by the house. I would stop and ask if I could help. And it's really the first time I ever used a circular saw, ever tried to measure things, ever used the triangular piece of equipment known as a square in order to make a straight cut, ever used a pencil on a piece of wood. That was when I was helping these guys out. And the process, I got to see on a regular basis, how a house came together. What was the process? What were the steps? What did you start with? And again, it was my free time. So if I messed up, it was like not a big deal. You know, it was like I was still helping out. I was helping these guys get stuff done. They were appreciative of my help and took the time to tell me how to do things properly. And in the process, I was like, okay, house building, not such a big deal. Working with wood, I can do that. I started buying tools and putting my tool collection together. I still have my circular saw, an old Makita, they call it a sidewinder, that I got, I bought it back when I was helping Danny and Tom out. And from there and from working with them, seeing how they did things, I was not intimidated by starting a project, whether it be making a bed or building a deck or whatever. I was like, okay, I can do this. I know I can do this. Okay, remind me next week to start off with a story of Danny uh, and Tom at the boatyard. Okay, I better write that down. Okay, hope you enjoyed. Have a good rest of your Saturday. Thank you. And one final good look at Kathmandu, Nepal during the monsoon season. Now, if it was clear, we could actually see past those clouds and those hills to the Himalayas. Okay, adios.